Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. My guests today are two of the best arguments against city council term limits. Both are smart, tough, fair, and straight shooters. What more can you ask from a pal? Here to talk about the city council, dysfunction in Albany, Mike Bloomberg, medical marijuana, the public schools, and more, are council member Philip Reed, representing the 8th Council Manic District, which includes East Harlem, Manhattan Valley, and parts of the South Bronx, and former council member Ken Fisher, current partner with the firm of Phillips Neiser. Welcome back, gentlemen. Thank you. I just want to remind both of you that you were both among my very first guests in October 2001. We started in September. And Phil, you appeared with Giff Miller, and you were talking about this new city council with 38 new members caused by term limits, and you both talked about your qualifications for leadership as speaker. <laughs> yes. Kenny, you were on with Helen Marshall, and both of you were term limited out of office, and you were both running for a borough presidency, you in Brooklyn and Helen in and Queens. And since then, you've become the Larry King of CUNY TV. Oh, God. I don't, that, that's, I don't know if that's a compliment or not to either well, one of us. Well, maybe it's hardball. Or oh, I, well, well, hopefully it's not softball. The, the Daily Show? Oh, I'll, I'll take all of those things. Phil. You've been in this council for three years. You just concluded a, a sort of crazy session, and you served in the previous council along with uh, Kenny. Compare this council, this post-2001, this post-term limits council. Just give me a broad assessment of its accomplishments, its failures, its weaknesses. Talk to me. Well, I think it's a much more dynamic council. Just if, certainly, if you look at it, I... I laughed to people. I said, when I first came in the council, I was in the lower third of the age group. Um, quite literally now in this new council, I'm the sixth oldest member of the city council. You got old. So I got old. They all aged me. But uh, almost 50% of the council is in their 20s and 30s. So you really have to take that into consideration. Um, they're very activist. They're, they're ambitious. Uh, they're inquisitive. So there's a lot of activity. Um, does it necessarily generate good legislation? I'm not sure, but there's certainly a lot of inquiry into the areas of their responsibility. Uh, and I also think that, you know, they are demanding and getting from the leadership a lot more of a role, significant role in budget and in policy decisions. Okay. You were part of this fresh democracy council that talked about changing the rules and democratizing the body and the speaker. Talk about... I wasn't. If, a, I, I mean, that was the new group that came in. Right. I was there with the council. Right. Right. So, success? How do we grade this council? How do we grade the leadership? Has, compare Miller with his predecessor, Bologna, and then I want to go with you, Kenny. Well, Gifford Miller himself is a 34-year-old uh, and I think he came in there uh, on what was a lot closer vote than people outside understood. Mm -hmm. And he had commitments to opening up the communication. So we meet, for instance, as a Democratic caucus, um, which allows us to meet privately quite frequently, at least once a month, mm -hmm. and have significant discussion about policy and budget. Plus, the Budget Negotiating Committee, I think, is much more hands-on than they had been in the previous council. I started to diminish uh, Councilmember Vallone Sr.'s role, uh, which he certainly was supportive of a lot of things, for me, that people felt his politics might not have supported. Mm -hmm. um, and I appreciated his tenure there. But in this council, there's a much more active role of people with access to uh, the speaker. Okay. Kenny, you came in in 1991, and I had the pleasure of working for you in that campaign. That was the post 
sure to change uh, council where the council really became a more prominent player in the city government, a, a better counterweight to the mayor. When I was chief of staff to Tony Olivieri in the late 70s, it was a dictatorship. We had no information. We used to get the bills the day after they were passed. They had voting by proxy in those days. They had voting by proxy in those days. So people wouldn't show up for months. Talk about the council that you were in. And now as sort of a, an informed outsider, take a look at this new council. Doug, I think the, the biggest difference uh, between the, the current council and the council that I served in was that the, the voters chose uh, when they adopted term limits, um, new energy over experience. Mm -hmm. um, when I got to the council in 91, there were council members that had been serving at that point for almost uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. They had their districts down. That meant that some of them didn't have to work very hard at all, at anything. Mm -hmm. Others were allowed to take on uh, citywide leadership positions through their committees mm -hmm. uh, in whatever area they, they had a particular expertise or, a, uh, or an interest in. I think Valone's biggest accomplishment, um, other than perhaps the Safe Cities legislation and, and the financing of, uh, of the criminal justice revolution, was that he built the institution of the council. Um, he recruited the staff. He started to establish the land use procedures, the budget negotiations. All of that was pretty much of a blank slate mm -hmm. when, they, uh, when they took over. But I think that, that what we, we miss out on in these sort of successive um, charter changes is, is that fundamentally, while the council has a more prominent role than it did um, in the, uh, before the charter change in 89, it is not an equal branch of government. Mm -hmm. The people who wrote the charter basically were taking uh, power away from out of borough politicians that they thought were beholden to the political clubs and therefore corrupt the after the, the borough presidents and they gave most of that power to the uh, to the mayor they gave some of that power to the council but then they enlarged the size of the council and kind of diffused that power um, so that the that the council can act as a voice but in the final analysis they wanted the mayor to run the city, and regardless of who that mayor is or how good the mayor is, the mayor runs the city. And one other thing that I think is important is to bear in mind, in, in that sort of context, mm -hmm. Doug, since the 1950s, only one mayor has been from outside of Manhattan. Uh, when, they, when they were writing the charter, it was very clear, no offense to, to Manhattan, and not all Manhattan is the same, but in terms of how the political establishment views the city, what they trust is some man from Manhattan mm -hmm. keeping everybody else at bay. Okay. I would disagree with that just a little bit because in the charter, it does, the charter does give the city council ultimate control uh, over the land use and the budget. Mm -hmm. So which are the two most significant things that we do but, but from so a government like perspective. However, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with the budget, if you don't have a compromised budget with the mayor, you not only have a standstill because the mayor has the authority to spend the money and right. then the mayor doesn't spend the money and so then you have a meltdown so you really have to come back and renegotiate that piece and particularly because of the role that the press plays where the press only discusses what the mayor is doing it was classic in this debate that many of us were extremely frustrated with the media, mm -hmm. that the only thing they could talk about mm -hmm. was $400 rebate, $400 rebate, yep. when the counterbalance to that was this earned income tax credit. And we only and, heard and, about it afterwards. And you could not get the Times in their almost full page spent one half of one sentence describing earned income tax credit, which was the council's significant proposal. So the media gives so much weight to what the mayor does and still tries to refer to us as second-rate elected officials. It's mm -hmm. a very frustrating situation. Mm -hmm. So I think Ken is right, but if you look at how the charter is written, the, the scales are more equally balanced. But ultimately the mayor is the siren, the voice, and has the authority to either stop government from moving or directing it. Kenny, do you want to well, respond? Well, I, I wanted to get back to the to the, the threshold question you asked about the difference in the councils right. because I agree with Phil that when you when you have a a very um, uh, energetic group of people coming in, some of whom had served in government positions sure. before. Mm -hmm. They were not all amateurs. They were coming from social services or through their, their community organizations. They were willing to take a fresh look at issues and to bring some mm -hmm. issues to the table mm -hmm. that had been been bottled up. 
But I think that the other thing that, that's happening is is that they've got a clock ticking also. It's right. that, that they're going to be out in a relatively short period of time, and it makes it difficult to focus on um, uh, problems uh, like the city's massive amount of debt, for example, that, that stretch out, you know, mm -hmm. when the chickens come home to roost after, um, after you've moved on Absolutely. to the, the next position. But I, I, I was curious, uh, Phil, because it, it, it's something I was watching from a distance. It, the, the, the mayor's $400 tax rebate was, was, was somewhat posited against uh, the speaker's proposal for a 2% rollback. A <laughs> uh, the the earned income Go tax on. credit um, was an important piece of legislation, a very important democratic initiative mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a Republican uh, mm -hmm. uh, era. But how did the, what happened to the 2% rollback? That, I, what was the dynamic that led to the mayor getting his way? Well, uh, and uh, that's a very good question. I and I also just want to say the mayor, this mayor, Bloomberg, also in terms of relations with the new council, has allowed access and communication with his commissioners and his administration much more tenfold times what the previous administration did. So to his credit, and I think in the spirit after 9-11, there, while we have issues and debates and arguments, mm -hmm. the access, the ability to call the people on the phone and communicate what those things are um, is completely different than, than the dynamic that it was. The interesting thing that happened in the council was that then during the budget piece that I think uh, Speaker Miller really had put forward this plan about the 2% mm -hmm. rollback, which uh, is a structural rollback as opposed to this opportunistic sort of rebate if the weather is good. Right. <laughs> um, and that sort of got some mileage for a while, but a significant number of people on the council, not just the liberals, so to speak, began to ask the question about the structural imbalance, the out years, as we call it, and reminding people that when we did the 18.5% tax increase to balance the budget, at the very same time, we still cut programs that were acknowledged to be being cut further than was healthy. So many of us asked, why are we not re- supporting that floor mm -hmm. at a level that's sustainable for these services before we talk about this cutback in services. And in fact, the, the proposal from the council slash Gifford Miller actually put more, took more money out of the city's funds than the mayor's. And so we in the council began to say, wait, 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 we don't want to offer a tax rebate. We don't want to offer a tax cut. And even people from the other boroughs, I prefer that to the outer boroughs, the single-family homeowners, from Brooklyn and Queens. the single-family homeowners, um, were not hard-pressed to make the case. They were not saying that their constituents, with the exception of one or two that felt that there had been a commitment made to them, were not arguing that they had to give this money mm -hmm. back. And they argued that they could go to their constituents with a straight face and say that we needed to keep this level of taxation in order to support the libraries being open right. five, six right. days a week, all, all of the Child sort of lifeline right. programs right. that people need. And so that began to shift the dynamic within the council. And, and you sort of saw the proposal for the 2% disappear because we were not willing to say that in fact we had $300 million to give away right. when we don't. And we're not paying off the debt. Right. We're not looking at any of those proposals that have been put forward. And there was no demand. That's the interesting thing. The mayor created this demand by going through his sort of, you know, it, 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 it's a good soundbite, $400 rebate. Mm -hmm. But still, there is not people beating down the door for their $400. Let me, before you jump in again, Ken, the mayor ran as this CEO who was going to grapple with the structure of finances in New York City. And this mayor really has not dealt with the structural imbalance. He's essentially governed as a moderate to liberal Democrat, which was what he was before he decided to run for mayor. And it appears to many people to be a mistake. Why, why the promise and not the delivery in your mind? I think that he is concerned about his reelection. I think that uh, incorrectly people have said to him, you know, you need to be 
more tuned to what's happening out there. Ken knows perfectly well that there's still an imbalance in how taxes are applied to families, whether they're in co-ops or condos or single-family homeowners. But the mayor is not uh, saying this is you know, what really needs to be done about that, and he's just basically pandering to that group. There's 265,000, evidently, people who will get this tax rebate. I think if you broke that down, you'd probably find 200,000 of those people who are going to miss the services that they would get if we kept the $400 rebate. And the mayor has chosen not to make that argument. That's regrettable. And not only that, but, but for, for, for people like me, I live in a single family house. Mm -hmm. uh, that, 200, that $400 is actually worth less than that because I can right. deduct uh, right. my tax payments off right. of my, my federal right. taxes. Doug, I think that, that the situation that Bloomberg was faced with after 9-11 was different from what he anticipated when he ran for, mm -hmm. uh, for mayor. And he appears to have made a judgment after 9-11 that the most important thing that he could do was not to frighten people mm -hmm. into leaving the city. Well, right. we, we, you know, we forget how, how right. close everybody was right. to flee. Right. So instead of saying, look, it's a crisis and we've got to cut deep and, and, and take advantage and structural change and push the unions and, and, and take advantage of the mood of the city, they made the judgment, and I think it was a conscious judgment, that they were going to calm things down, right. they were going to act as if everything was okay. And what's happened since then is, is that uh, because the national economy has been sputtering along, Wall Street is doing a little better, mm -hmm. interest rates are low, what Bloomberg is doing is a growth strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to rezone large parts of the city to right. bring in jobs and to create housing. He's going to hope that the city continues to grow its way out of the structural uh, deficit. And if, um, if that strategy is successful, it'll help transform the city. If, on the other hand, we dip back into some type of a recession or Wall Street has um, some more bumps in the road, um, we're even more off balance than we were right. before 9-11. Right. I mean, we were, look, we were looking at a $3.8 billion budget hole for the next fiscal year, and it seems as if the city's strategy is buy votive candles and pray for a reinvigorated economy. Uh, well, that's not necessarily you, a bad strategy. It no, worked right, for Giuliani right, for a big part right. of his administration. So, so, sometimes, it, sometimes it does work. What I want to do now sometimes is... Sometimes they catch the Hail Mary pass. <laughs> that's right. They, they throw it in and, 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 right. and they do catch it. One of the striking things about the last week was that the city council and the mayor, in a relatively cordial way, at least publicly, I know there's battles internally, produced a budget that was balanced, on time early. Meanwhile, you go up, what, 130 miles and you're in Albany and you really have the state of dysfunction. You've got, a, a, what, what's the story with Albany? It obviously doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? What's, what's wrong? Phil? Kenny? Well, I think what, certainly one difference that we have is that we have, you know, we have one body, we have unicameral, and it's not a Republican or Democratic mm -hmm. legislative body that has jousting in and of itself, let alone with the mayor. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, they've allowed too much power to accumulate in the hands of the legislative leadership. I, I would think, after all this denunciation, listen, I admire my colleagues in the state legislature, but I don't envy them, for still continuing to try to fight the good fight around the issues that are significant and of importance to our cities, citizens. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, I don't think it's anything short of a revolution of the members. To me, mm -hmm. the, the thing that people don't understand is the membership sets their own rules. Mm -hmm. The memberships determine the power of the leadership, whether it's given or presumed. And I think after the excoriating, that, excoriation that they're getting, even in, if you listen to what's going on in upstate New York, oh. as I'm told, the, the county execs, are there. oh, they're killing them. And so I think they're going to run candidates who are just going to say, sort of like this fresh democracy thing that happened, but that we didn't need to make the changes that they need to make up mm -hmm. there. I would hope, because the paralysis doesn't benefit anybody. There's two other factors, um, and I agree with, with, with what Phil was saying. One is, is that the technology of politics has become so powerful mm -hmm. that there are very few districts that change hands unless you have a massive shakeup 
you know, as a result of a, a carry landslide or, or so forth. But wait a minute, it's also the way it's districted. You guys are districted by a nonpartisan commission. Right. Each house there less districts partisan. themselves. Right. right? And, well, less partisan. And, and, I think, and I think that's part of it, the technology right. of figuring out the demographics. So, you know, possibly this year with a, with a carry landslide anticipated in New York, you True. could see uh, potentially either a shift in control of the state senate or at least getting closer mm. to it um, and, and see how that plays out. I also think that, that you know, it's easy to blame the press, and I, I've never been in that school, but I think the press coverage of uh, the state legislature is, is just appalling. That you get editorials uh, in the major New York dailies kicking uh, uh, the hell out of them uh, mm -hmm. on a regular basis, but they don't really mean anything. It just right. it, it falls on deaf ears. But in the meantime, you've had a major Republican state senator who was convicted of major malfeasance in office. You've had a Democratic uh, assemblyman who was right. convicted of stealing from the taxpayers. Counsel to the speaker of one of, of the assembly um, has a, a sexual uh, issue. And it's basically one day stories. Now, I would, I would dare say that if council member Reed was, uh, you know, was caught shoplifting a pair of shoelaces from a, from a newsstand in front of City Hall, it would be a much bigger story than these considerably sure. more significant sure. uh, problems that were exposed in uh, Albany. So here's a simple proposal, um, is, and that is, is that they ought to move uh, the state legislative sessions around the state. They ought to meet a third of the year in New York yeah. City, a third of the year in Albany, let them go to Buffalo for a third of the, uh, a third of the year, and let the voters see how the process, uh, process works. Ooh. Ooh. So, but bottom line is, this revolution isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen internally. I'm not sure that's true. You think it might. I, 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 I was I, always I, thinking that you needed a constitutional convention, which is extremely unlikely, just the mechanism to get it. But you need to th almost throw out or re-examine the entire system. Well, you know, you have people like Tom Swoosey out in Long Island mm -hmm. suggesting that they run people. Except um, he didn't get invited to the Democratic National well, Committee so for what? being nasty. So okay. what? I mean, the, the point is, this Detect. is a very credible guy yeah. who is the first Democrat in, in, I don't know, 50 years to take over a county that was run by Republicans. And I'm not suggesting that the story couldn't be flipped. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, youthful people who are saying, we cannot accept this. We are county leaders who are finding it impossible to conduct business with a stalemated and stagnant and virtually rendered irrelevant state legislature. Okay. And I think the membership themselves really cannot go with a straight face to their constituents and say, you should elect. Yes, I've brought back some bacon and some pork mm -hmm. and here is the program. Mm -hmm. But structurally, I don't think that that can last. And I think we are going to see some shift internally very soon within the next couple of years because it's reached a point where it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Particularly okay. if there's a new governor after right. uh, uh, 2006. After 2006. Okay. Let's move to some pieces of legislation that you've been involved in this past week. On Monday, uh, the council passed a resolution sponsored by you on medical marijuana. They also passed a bill on racial and ethnic profiling that you were the author of. And, that, and also the council overrode uh, the mayor's veto on uh, domestic partnership uh, coverage. Mm -hmm. Talk about each of these. Talk about the mer medical marijuana. Is this going to happen? I know that in the state, at least since 1980, there's been you know legislation on the books that permits this, but it's, well, then it's a very nowhere. Awkward, yeah, the legislation that's presently there is so awkward and right. so difficult that it's it's really not relevant. But it, you, I think you could tie all those three pieces of legislation together to talking about dignity uh, and respect mm -hmm. for the individual. Certainly the medical marijuana bill, uh, I'm a person who has had intimate knowledge of uh, huge medical problems, intractable pain. Uh -huh. I've been on chemotherapy yep. for 25 months. I understand that. Um, and even the medical association is coming out now saying this is one form of treatment. And so the council, uh, in a rather nervous Nelly moment, um, was holding back on something that I think the public is well prepared to accept. It's interesting how many people have come to me, really, and or called me and thanked me privately or quietly. People that you would not assume because their mother, their wife is suffering from some illness mm -hmm. where this gives them some relief of pain. Sure. And so the council 
has passed this resolution. And surprisingly, I thought a lot of Republicans and conservative Democrats were on board on that. Because and every one of these people it. have had personal uh -huh. experiences where you watch a loved one of yours suffering unbelievable pain or wasting away or not being able to take their medication, mm -hmm. and you say, there's something that I can give them mm -hmm. that will relieve that suffering. All of a sudden, this moralistic thing about drugs, when the reality is there are much more powerful and much more addictive drugs on the market mm -hmm. that you could buy with a prescription mm -hmm. and $300 mm -hmm. than to simply have the opportunity to smoke some marijuana. So we did, we passed this resolution on yesterday. Uh, I was terrific, enormously grateful because this is something I've worked on because the advocates have come to me. I've seen the evidence of it. The racial and ethnic profile, and we all remember the reign of terror mm -hmm. uh, during the Giuliani years. And if you were African-American or Latino, uh, and particularly male, you assumed that once or twice a year you were going to be thrown up against the wall just on general principles, that the police's general principles. Mm -hmm. um, when the new administration came in with the commissioner that we re remembered from the, from the Dinkins administration, mm -hmm. they soon acknowledged, soon acknowledged that there was a real problem with this, a real problem and a perceived problem, and the antagonism within the communities that most, most needed to have a relationship with the police. And this so legislation formalizes... Formalizes this, but it also broadens it out to all law enforcement agencies in the city of New York, not just the police, and it also bans profiling through race and religion, particularly now after 9-11, you're finding many people in the Muslim community that are feeling intimidated and profiled. So. This is a piece of legislation that I introduced prior to 9-11. We sort of held it back because after 9-11 with this new administration, we were trying to heal things. Uh, but I think it's groundbreaking. Um, and I'm delighted that it's gotten through both the committee uh, and it has the support of the mayor. Gentlemen, we're out of time. <laughs> I'm shocked. Too much fun with two friends.